Okay, well, it's uh, nice to be here. Um, I think I did a, a few talks during the COVID time when um, uh, none of us were meeting physically. Um, so it's actually just nice to physically come and um, share with you today. Um, my name's Vincent. I, um, I worship at Bethel Green Mission Church. Um, I think you know quite a few people from there. Um, so it's really nice just to be able to, to come down and um, yeah, share with you this morning. Um, I've chosen a psalm to speak on. Uh, I don't know if you've got Bibles uh, in front of you. If you have, it would be really helpful if you could turn to the psalm we'll be looking at, which is uh, Psalm 84. Uh, if you haven't, uh, yeah, there it is. It's up there. It's up on the screen, so you can either have it in front of you or uh, you can look at what's on the screen. Uh, just before I start looking at this psalm, let's just pause and pray. That helps me just to, uh, um, yeah, ask God for help as I speak and, and for us all that we would learn something maybe new. Um, certainly we'd be encouraged, maybe challenged by what we find in this psalm in this kind of short time that we have now. So let's just pray. Lord, thank you that we have the freedom to meet uh, on a Sunday morning. Thank you that we're here today and we're able to be here today. Thank you that we've been able to sing and reflect and pray. And just in this time now, uh, help me as I speak that I may... Uh, be guided by you and strengthened by you. Help us all as we listen. We pray for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding, insight. Pray this psalm would speak uh, to us um, together as a church. I pray it would speak to us individually in uh, whatever our situation is at the moment, that this psalm may speak into that situation. Guide us, enlighten us by your Holy Spirit, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, just something um, about the Psalms before I look at this one specifically. Now, the Psalms are, uh, are often referred as the songbook in the Old Testament. And um, actually it's true that they were written to be sung in the temple. I think it's worth remembering when you read a Psalm that um, the Psalms were the songbook that, that Jesus himself would have used. Now, most of Scripture we read, both in the Old and New Testament, speaks directly to us. By that I mean it, it's direct teaching on how we should live as individuals, how we should live with one another, or it's direct teaching about God's character, about our human nature, or we have the stories, which we call the narratives, both in the Old and, and the New Testament in the Gospels, um, that, that kind of tell us much about God's character, tell us much about human nature as well. But I always think the Psalms are in contrast to um, the rest of the Bible because they're a, a kind of precious and unique part of Scripture because they give us the words by which we can speak to God. So the Psalms not only speak to us, but they can also speak for us. What do I mean by that? Well, if you read through the Psalms, there's 150, they, they express a wide range of moods and feelings from joyful praise, and actually some of those songs we've been singing this morning uh, are taken directly from, from the Psalms. Joyful praise to deep despair, from confident proclamation to real expressions of doubt and confusion. In other words, the Psalms were written by people of faith, living in a perplexing and unpredictable world, written by people who expressed a range of joys and sorrows, who experienced great highs and lows. In other words, those who wrote the Psalms were people like you and I this morning who experience life like you and I experience life. 
And I believe what the Psalms give us is a language which which to speak to God. And if we are speaking to God, well, that always represents a vital part of our relationship with him because it's the, the strength of that relationship that will sustain us in our Christian life and walk. So, the Psalms are actually there in the Bible to be our own prayer book. They can help us put into words what we may be feeling. And that's why I think it's a a kind of unique part of Scripture because it's given to us to use in this way. Something else that I think is very significant about the Psalms, as we come and read them now as New Testament believers, obviously the Psalms are part of the Old Testament, We are now in the New Testament, we're in New Testament times, we're New Testament believers. The Gospel of Luke records for us three different encounters that the first disciples had with the risen Jesus on the first day after the resurrection. It's in Luke 24, you need to look it up. Um, The first encounter that Luke records was at the empty tomb. And then the second counter was on the road to Emmaus, when two people were walking with Jesus and he he talked with them, they had a meal. And then we have the third encounter when Jesus appeared to the gathered disciples in a room and when he came in, we're told that they thought he was a ghost. In response to that, he showed them his hands and his feet and he sat down and ate some broiled fish in their presence to show that he wasn't a ghost. Then, Luke records that Jesus said this to his disciples. Jesus said, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Then he, Jesus, opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. I found that quite striking that he said, you know, I told you all about me. I'm in the law, I'm in the prophets, I'm in the Psalms. And as New Testament believers in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, we always need to read the Old Testament through New Testament eyes. We need to ask, is there something here when we read the Old Testament that is pointing prophetically to Christ? And that's what I want to do this morning as we come to this psalm, Psalm 84. Just something about the context of this psalm before we start reading it. As I said, there are 150 psalms and There are five different books uh, that make up the whole. Books 1 and 2, which is up to Psalm 72, are mainly written around the period when when David was alive, and many of those psalms are attributed to to David himself. Book 3 is Psalm 73 to Psalm 89, only 17 psalms. And they are believed to be mainly written for the people of God when they were taken into exile to Babylon, which is a much later period than when David was alive. So keep that in mind, because that time when the the people of God, when Jerusalem was was destroyed effectively and the Babylonian army came in and and took a a great lot of uh, uh, people from Jerusalem into Babylon. It was spiritually a very testing time. The people of God were far away from the familiar. They were far away from their land. They were far away from the temple. And um, because they were away from the temple, they were far away through all the, the things they were used to about the priests and the sacrifices that were offered. So it was both, if you like, it was a physical exile in that they were taken physically from Jerusalem, from Israel to Babylon, uh, but it was also a spiritual exile as well. And there are some very poignant psalms in this section, Psalm 73 uh, to Psalm 89, and I've chosen one of those today, which is Psalm 84. 
Now, if you have it open in front of you, you'll see it was written by the sons of, of Korah. They were, they were the ones who, who would have led the worship in the, in the temple. And it's in three sections, and um, each section is, is broken up by a word. Uh, I've got it in my translation here, and that word is Sela, S-E-L-A-H, which is thought is, is probably a musical tone, uh, a word that means pause, stop. So I'm going to use the structure as it was written, which is verses 1 to 4, verses 5 to 8, and verses 9 to 11. So we're going to just look at this in three parts. And after we've read each section, I'm going to ask this question. Is there something that points us to Christ that as New Testament believers we can resonate with, be encouraged uh, by, or challenged by? So hopefully that's clear. Psalm 84. So I'm going to read the first section now, which is Psalm 84, verses 1 to 4. And it says this. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. So that's the, the opening of the psalm. Now when this writer talks about the dwelling place of God and the courts of the Lord, he's referring, of course, to the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And what is clear right from the outset of this psalm is that because this writer is in exile, the psalmist is now far from the temple, which is why we're told his soul yearns, even faints to be back there. He longs to see and to know the glory of God, which for him means that he longs to go to Jerusalem and the temple, for that represented both the presence and glory of God in the Old Testament. What about us now? What about us sitting here this morning as we read this psalm? Because as New Testament believers, we no longer focus our faith, if you like, on a particular place, a city, or a building. The New Testament reveals to us a different way that God has shown his glory. It's not about a physical location. What we really need to kind of grasp and understand as New Testament believers is God has shown his glory now through a person. A reminder of what we read at the beginning of John's Gospel. When John, in writing, introduces us to the person of Jesus, John wrote these words, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. At the outset of the New Testament, we're actually told there is now a new focus if we want to see and understand the glory of God. It is no longer about a place, but rather it is about a person. What do we see when we focus upon that person? Well, when we focus on Jesus, what do we see? We see love, mercy, compassion, courage, faithfulness, and as John emphasises at the beginning of his Gospel, we see someone who was the embodiment of grace and truth. Um, a book that has really helped me through the years is uh, 
this book's very old um, edition, this now. I've had it a number of years. Probably got, I'm sure it's got a new cover. It's called The Jesus um, I Ever I The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey. Anyone read this book? Some people have read this book. Good. I'd recommend it. I'd still dip into this sometime, find it very helpful. Um, I just want to read you a little excerpt which comes at the end of the book in actually uh, the last chapter. The last chapter in the book, um, in this book he, he kind of goes through different aspects of, of the life of, and person of Jesus. And in the last chapter it's called The Difference He Makes. And he talks about kind of the difference that knowing this person has made to his life. And I just want to read you part because I think he sums up what I'm trying to say here when I say our focus now is not upon a place, but it's upon a person. He writes this. Books of theology tend to define God by what he is not. Immortal, invisible, infinite. But what is God like positively? For the Christian, Jesus answers all such all-important questions. The Apostle Paul boldly called Jesus the image of the invisible God, which means Jesus was God's exact replica, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. God is, in a word, Christ-like. Jesus presents a God with skin on whom we can take or leave, love or ignore. In this visible scaled down model, we can discern God's features more clearly. I must admit that Jesus has revised in flesh many of my harsh and unpalatable notions about God. Why am I a Christian? He asked himself. I sometimes ask this myself, and to be perfectly honest, the, t- uh, the reasons reduce to two. One, the lack of good alternatives, and two, Jesus. Brilliant, untamed, tender, creative, slippery, irreducible, paradoxically humble, Jesus stands up to scrutiny. He is who I want my God to be. Martin Luther encouraged his students to flee the hidden God and run to Christ. And I now know why. If I use a magnifying glass to examine a a fine painting, the object in the centre of the glass stays crisp and clear, while around the edges the views grow increasingly distorted. For me, Jesus has become the focal point of my faith. When I speculate about such imponderables as the problem of pain or providence versus free will, everything becomes fuzzy. But if I look at Jesus himself, at how he treated actual people in pain, at his calls to free and diligent action, clarity is always restored. I found that very helpful. For the writer of Psalm 84, his focus and his longing, understandably, in the time he lived in, was on the temple and all what went on there because he knew it was there that he would meet with the living God. For us now, our focus is on Christ that we may long to know him more deeply in order that we can know God more fully. And as it says in the psalm there, Salah, have a pause to think on that. Let's go to our next section in this psalm then, which is verses 5, the verses 5 to 9, 5 to 8 says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength 
till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Now, I'll just read verse 5 again where that starts off because there's a sense in which I think this verse right in the middle of the psalm is probably the key verse in the psalm. It says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Please note that the psalmist declares that an important hallmark of any believer is this, that they have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Pilgrimage always involves a journey. That is what a pilgrim is, they're on a journey. The psalmist here, of course, was referring to a physical journey that believers in that time would make in order to go to Jerusalem and the temple. A journey, actually, that would involve, at points, hardship and would require perseverance and endurance. The psalmist underlines this in this section by saying that en route to the city of God, that the pilgrim has to pass through the valley of Baca. Now, what did he mean when he wrote this in the psalm? This isn't actually a a physical valley that you can go and walk through today. There's not a a valley on on the way to Jerusalem called the Valley of Baca. It's actually a figurative expression. The Valley of Baca means one of two things, or maybe both. The Hebrew word Baca means either weeping or it could mean a place of dryness in that it's associated with balsam trees that are common uh, in dry, arid places. So, the Valley of Baca is talking about weeping and dryness, either or both. And please note that the psalmist doesn't say if they pass through, but he actually says as they pass through the Valley of Baca indicating that times of grief and tears, times of of spiritual dryness and struggle, when you may be feeling spiritually barren, is an inevitable experience of any pilgrim, whether you're in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. From the Psalms, from all the narratives and the stories we have in the Old Testament, from the Gospels, from the teachings of the New Testament, I would say this is a consistent theme throughout the whole of Scripture. And from which we have to conclude is an aspect, if you like, of the normal Christian life and something we should actually expect and not be shocked by when it comes. And it's also something that we should neither fear or despise when we find ourselves in that place. Why do I say that? Well, look what the the psalmist says here in this psalm, that the valley of Baca actually becomes a place of springs, actually becomes a place of refreshment, a place where the rains suddenly come down and bring new life. So what we have is the picture of a pilgrim emerging from this valley, not crushed or broken, but actually, according to this psalm, going from strength to strength. The writer talks about passing through this valley, not being stuck there and remaining. And with faith and trust and perseverance, I think what we're encouraged by in this, in this psalm is that the valley can be a place, can be a place to tangibly discover God's faithfulness, God's care, God's love in actually a deep and profound way. When I enter this valley of, of weeping and dryness, how I respond, how I respond to the situation, I think will make or mar me as a Christian. Now, let's be honest, our our natural reaction, my natural reaction, can be one of self-pity or it can be one of despair 
it's very easy to retreat into the why me frame of mind, why this has happened to me, alongside the question, why not them? I think that's a kind of natural response. But I have to say, as believers, we need to guard against this taking hold in our thinking, because ultimately that can become self-destructive. Instead, what we're encouraged by all the way through Scripture in the Old and New Testament is by faith, we can believe that the they that we have in verse 6 can be us now. And the valley for us now can actually, in the end, become a place of springs. The valleys, you see, have the potential to make us stronger, to make us wiser. For if we meet the trials that we inevitably face with faith, it can bring fresh power for future service. And isn't it encouraging that verse 6 in this psalm has the pilgrim passing through this valley, and then you get to verse 7, and we have the pilgrim coming out of the valley, going from strength to strength. Note the order. The strength has been increased through the experience of passing through the valley first. And I kind of think we can take that as an encouragement. And then we think of ourselves now as New Testament believers. Where are we to find our strength now? Well, quite simply, we're to find our strength in Christ. And one way to do this is to consider the journey that he took, that actually Jesus took, both physically and spiritually, when he went to the cross, a journey that inevitably meant sacrifice and suffering. And if we choose to walk the way of Christ, it must involve going the way of the cross. But just like the Old Testament pilgrim going through the Valley of Baca on the way to the temple, it can ultimately be a place of springs where we can discover new strength, encouragement and hope. Just to underline this and and hopefully encouraging us now, just listen to what the writer to the Hebrews said in the New Testament. He was writing to a, a group of Christians who were finding the journey they were on very tough to the point that they were being tempted to give up completely and go back. In response to this, this is what he wrote. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How? That's my word. He didn't write that. How can we write, um, run out, run with perseverance a race marked mark out for us? And the writer says this, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Please note that in this section in Psalm 84, the psalm starts with the word blessed, which actually means receiving the approval and the anointing of God. Blessing for our journey now comes from knowing, I think, that Christ has gone before us and walks alongside us now and walks alongside us particularly in the valleys until we finally reach our destination, which obviously isn't physically Jerusalem now, but which is the new Jerusalem, which will be our heavenly destination. Final section from this psalm then is, uh, is verses 9 to 11. So I'll just read this. It's the final uh, part. Look on our shield, O God, look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and shield, the Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, Blessed are those who trust in you. Now in 
verse 11 in this psalm, the psalmist declares two things about God that should give us confidence as we're on this journey now. And it's the promise of provision. The Lord is a sun and the Lord is a shield. The sun is the source of life. A shield is a, a, a symbol of protection. We have the offer of grace. And we're told that as we honour him, he will also honour us. And the lovely promise that he will withhold no, no good thing from us. There's an interesting declaration from the psalmist in verse 10. He declares this, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the house of the wicked. I want to finish by considering what this may say to us this morning. Now, being a doorkeeper in God's house is, as the psalmist writes, it's sufficient for the psalmist, psalmist. He valued this role above anything that the world could offer him. Does this in any way resonate with Christ and his calling to us? How would you... How would you view the task of a doorkeeper? What image comes to your mind as you, you read this? What image of a doorkeeper kind of comes to your mind? For me, what comes to my mind is that it is, above all, a humble role. One that is, is more for a servant than for someone who has power and prestige and status. Does this not resonate with Christ? Both in relation to what he taught and how he lived. We read in the Gospels that just before Jesus went to the cross, that an argument broke out among the disciples regarding who was the greatest among them. Two of them, two of the disciples, James and John, actually came to Jesus and requested if they could sit, one at the right, one at the left, when Jesus came into his glory. So obviously I think those two were thinking they were the greatest among the disciples. Let me read to you the response of Jesus to that request. If you did want to look it up later, I'm taking this from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. But I'll just read it to you now. It says this. Jesus called them, that is the disciples, together and said this. You know that those who were regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here Jesus gives us the mark of greatness in the kingdom of God. And it's the willingness to assume the humble role. It's a willingness to choose the place of a, sermon, of a servant. Humility and greatness, they are not two words that go together in worldly thinking. But Christ reveals that these do very much go together when it comes to living in the kingdom of God. How does humility express itself? Well, we can express a humble attitude in a variety of ways when we're happy to give credit and praise to others and deflect it from ourselves. When we're willing to listen to others and not fight to have the final word. When we're gentle and we're gracious with those who fail or fall. I like the prayer of the humble heart. I got this from a prayer book. It said this, Lord, when I am wrong, make me willing to change. And when I am right, make me easy 
to live with. Ultimately, the sign of humility is reflected in our willingness to serve others. The truth is that that power and position, two things the world will tell us are actually our measure of success, can actually be, spiritually speaking, very difficult to handle well. The teaching of Jesus, and of course the example of how he lived, should always make us ask, how can I serve more effectively, rather than how can I be more recognised? So, in Psalm 84, the psalmist expresses his humility by declaring his willingness and wanting to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, above anything else the world could offer. For us, as New Testament believers, and in the light of Christ's love, life, teaching, and the humility he amazingly showed us, we have to work out how we're going to show we are his disciples by following the one who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I hope that we're both encouraged and we're challenged by Psalm 84 as we read through it, not only from the Old Testament perspective, but I think more importantly, with a New Testament Christ-focused perspective that we're to focus not now on the temple in Jerusalem, on our pilgrimage, but on Christ, all that he is and all that he's done for us. That when we go through our own valley of Bacchanal, we will know Christ walks with us with the promise of his strength and grace to come out of the other end. That we will work out our own response as to what it practically means to follow the one who declared to his disciples that whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant and showed us tangibly in how he lived his life that before glory comes humility. Let's pray to finish now. I thought just... Um, to pray. I'd read this psalm as a whole because it's written as a prayer. It was written as a prayer to be said in the temple. It's a prayer that Christ would have, have, have said himself as he went to the temple. But I'll read it through now and as we read it, I hope that we can pray this together and we can also pray knowing far more than the psalmist does because we now know and we see the glory of God in Christ Jesus. So Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have a young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, for I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour and no good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. 
Lord God Almighty, blessed are those who trust in you. Amen.